In the previous video of this lecture, I went over some ways in which we can intuitively decide or determine whether an argument is deductively valid or not. So because what it means for an argument to be deductively valid is for the premises to guarantee the truth of the conclusion, the first way of determining this is that we assume the premises are true, and then we ask whether the conclusion also must be true. But we can also flip the argument, and we can also determine whether an argument is valid by first assuming the conclusion is false, and then wondering whether it's possible for all the premises to be true. And if it's not possible to assume the conclusion is false and all the premise is true, then we know the argument is valid. Because again, what validity means is that if the premises are true, then the conclusion must be. This notion of validity is itself informal. It relies on the idea of the prem certain premises guaranteeing uh, the truth of a con conclusion. And we can, as we've seen, determine whether arguments are valid or not in a kind of informal, intuitive way. Now, what we're going to be seeing starting next week is a way of determining whether arguments are valid or, valid or not using formal logic. And there are both advantages, advantages and disadvantages to using formal logic. The advantage is that we, we give ourselves a more precise or exact uh, recipe for determining validity. We're not relying on the in intuitions about what must be true given the premises. We're gonna see that we can develop actually a very rigorous uh, recipe for determining uh, whether an argument is valid. But the disadvantage is that in order to apply this recipe, we have to get a grip on what the logical form is of the argument. So we need a way of translating, in a sense, natural language sentences into ones of a formal logic. And when we translate the natural language sentences into a formal logic, the logical for form of those sentences is uh, made clear to us, and then we're able to use a recipe for uh, rigorously determining whether the argument is valid or not. But we'll see, and this is the disadvantage, that it's very difficult to, uh, in many cases, to turn natural language sentences into formal ones. Or another way of putting this point is that we'll see that it's very difficult to determine what the logical form is of an argument that we come across in natural language. And what we're going to be looking at is just one specific way of doing so, which captures one's aspect of validity. So over the next week or so, these points are hopefully will become more clear to you. So, but in, the, in this video, I'm going to begin introducing the idea of logical form and using logical symbolism to be able to tell whether an argument is valid or not. And next week, we're going to turn to devoting much more time to making a lot more sense of that. So to begin, I want you to consider this argument here. The first premise is that if it's raining, then the sidewalks are wet. The second premise is that it is raining. So therefore, conclusion, the sidewalks are wet. Now, first ask yourself, is this a valid argument? So in order to determine whether it is or not, what we want to do is try to figure out what the logical form is of the sentences in the argument. What's the logical form of the premises and the conclusion? OK. So here, the notion of a sentential connective will be very important to figuring out 
what the logical form is of various arguments. So the first premise, we have this complicated sentence. We have the, the entire sentence says, if it's raining, then the sidewalks are wet. So we call a sentence like this uh, conditional. And a conditional works where it connects, a conditional is a way of connecting to simpler sentences. So here in the first premise, we have the simple sentence, it's raining. And we have the simple sentence, the sidewalks are wet. And these two sentences are connected with uh, the if then way of connecting things. Okay, and what when we put slot into sentences with if and then, we get a conditional. Okay, so these two sentences are connected to create a conditional. And then we see the second premise is a simple sentence which restates the beginning of the conditional. And the conclusion is the second part of the conditional. Okay, so these colors indicate how these simple sentences are reoccurring. In the premise, in the second premise and the conclusion, they occur by themselves, but in the first premise, they occur, occur as parts of a more complex sentence, which is created using a sentential connective, the if-then. Other sentential connectives we'll see are uh, the word and, the word or, and the word not. So those, these, so the conditional as well as and, or, and not, for our deductive logic, which we'll dive into in much greater detail starting next week, those four connectives, again, the conditional, the and or conjunction, or or disjunction, and not or negation, these are the core connectives. Now, here's another important bit of terminology when we're talking about conditional sentences. So again, a conditional is a is something which says, if such and such, then so and so. In this case, the such and such and the so and so are the sentences, it's raining, and the sentence, it, the sidewalks are wet. Now, it's important to fix the terminology when we want to talk about the first part or the if part of a conditional and the second part or the uh, then part of a conditional. And the terminology, the standard terminology, um, is that the first part is called the antecedent. So in this conditional, if it's raining and the sidewalks are wet, in that conditional, the sentence it's raining is the antecedent. And the sentence, the sidewalks are wet, is the consequent. So when you read an if-then statement, you learn that for any case in which the antecedent obtains, the consequent must also obtain. Or another way of putting that is that any time the antecedent is true, the consequent must be true too. So again, with the conditional, for instance, if we say, if it's raining, then the sidewalks are wet. What we're saying is that if the antecedent is true, if it's true that we're raining, then it's true that the consequent holds, which is that the sidewalks are wet. And that's what a conditional is saying. If the antecedent, if the antecedent holds, then the consequent holds as well. So hopefully this sheds some light on the previous question of whether this argument is valid. So again, in this argument, the first premise is a conditional, which is, Again, the conditional that if it's raining, then the sidewalks are wet. And then we then say as a second premise that it is raining. And we infer that the sidewalks are wet. Here is another example of an argument with this same form. But again, here I've put in uh, strange nonsense words in order to divorce the idea of the form of a of an argument from the particular words that we uh, tend to use or understand. So let's suppose someone presents you with the following argument. Premise one, if the crottle is peristeronic, the petrichor is gambrinus. Uh, 
the crotal is parasuronic. Therefore, the petrichor is gambrinus. So this, despite the fact that we are using very strange words here, that, sent, that argument has the same form as this argument, okay? And the answer to a question to stop there being any suspense is that this is a valid argument. If it's true that if it's raining, then the sidewalks are wet and it's raining, then it must be true that the sidewalks are wet. And similarly, if it's true that if the crotal is peristeronic, then the petrichor is gambrinus and the crotal is peristeronic, then it must be the case that the petrichor is gambrinus. And just as above, where we highlighted the occurrences of these same sentences to show the form of the argument, where we have a conditional, where the first premise is a conditional, the second premise is the antecedent of that conditional, and the conclusion is a consequent of the conditional. Okay, so the colors highlight the important aspects of the form of this argument. We can also see that this argument here clearly, clearly has the same form. Here we have a conditional as a first premise. The second premise is the antecedent of that conditional and the conclusion is the consequent of the conditional. And now, instead of using colors, what we can do is start introducing um, letters. So here we're introducing a bit of formalism, okay? And, all, and so in, instead of having full sentences, we use capital P and the capital Q. And what the P here represents and the Q is it represents any arbitrary sentence that you could fill in for this argument. And no matter what sentence fills in the P's and no matter what sentences, sentence fills in the Q's, so as long as the same sentence is substituted throughout for each occurrence of P and each occurrence of Q, we'll get an argument that shares a form with these arguments. And any argument of this form will be valid. And this is a very important form of argument. And because of that, it has a fancy Latin name, which is modus ponens. So modus ponens is a form of argument where the, we have a conditional, if P then Q, and then we assert the antecedent of the conditional as, a second, as the other premise. So if P then Q, P, Therefore, Q, and we conclude uh, that our conclusion is the consequent of the conditional. Okay, so we've seen two examples of particular arguments of this form. So in this more normal case where we're talking about uh, real words as opposed to made up words, so the thing which fills in the P of our, law, of our uh, form of argument is the sentence, it's raining. And what fills in the Q is a sentence, uh, the sidewalks are wet. Okay. But we, and we'll see more examples where we have different sentences that are substituted in for these two uh, variables. But what's important to note with these uh, sentence letters or these variables is that what they're doing is symbolizing that if you put in any sentence whatsoever for P or Q throughout, you'll get a valid argument and argument of the form modus ponens. So here is a tip, for instance, for the LSAT, if that's something that you will be doing. And it's also a tip which should be helpful uh, for the quiz. So anytime you see a conditional or an if-then statement, you can logically infer the contra what's called the contrapositive of that conditional. So in general, the contrapositive of a conditional is one of the new conditional where the antecedent of the new conditional is the negation of the consequent of the old one, 
And the consequent of the new one is, is the negation of uh, the antecedent of the old one. So if we start with this simple conditional, if it's raining, the sidewalk's wet, the contrapositive of it is the following. If the sidewalk isn't wet, it isn't raining. Or again, if we have a simple conditional, if Tom's at the party, Sally is there too, we can logically infer the contrapositive that if Sally isn't there, Tom's not there either. Okay, so this, the idea that a, a conditional logically entails this contrapositive is an important thing to note. Now here is another argument form. So we just saw probably the most important uh, argument form called modus ponens. If P then Q, P therefore Q. Now the second most important uh, argument form is called modus tollens. So the way this argument form works so the form of the argument, again, we use uh, variables that uh, represent sentences. And the form of the argument is as follows. If P then Q, not Q, therefore not P. So here's an example. So as a first premise, for P, we can put in it's raining. And for Q, we can put in the sidewalk is wet. So the first premise is a conditional. If it's raining, then the sidewalk is wet. Now for the second premise, we negate the consequent. So the second premise is that if it is that the sidewalk is not wet. Okay, not Q. The sidewalk is not wet. And then if this conditional here is true, and if it's uh, the sidewalk is not wet, then we can infer the negation of the antecedent, which is that it is not raining. So that's how, that's one instance of the argument for Morris Tolland. Now I want, to, I want to ask you whether the following argument is good. Premise one, if it rains, the sidewalk's wet. Premise two, the sidewalk's wet. And let's say we wanted to conclude that it rained from those two premises. Is that a valid argument? You can also ask yourself, does that argument fit the form of either of the two we just saw, modus potens or modus tollens? And the answer is that this argument form here, where we say, if it rains, the sidewalk's wet, the sidewalk's wet, therefore it rains, that argument form actually looks like this and is not, is not the same form as uh, modus ponens or modus tollens. So the first premise is that, again, it is the same conditional, so if P then Q. But the second premise is that we uh, affirm Q. We affirm the consequent of the conditional. And then we try to uh, conclude that P. Okay, so that's different than modus tollens where we affirm the uh, where we uh, deny the consequent and infer and uh, infer the, the falsity of, of the antecedent. In modus potens, we affirm the antecedent and infer, infer uh, the truth of the consequent. But here, what we what we tried to do in this argument here, when we said if if it rains, the sidewalk's wet, the sidewalk's wet, uh, therefore it rains. What we did is that we affirmed the consequent, and then try to infer the antecedent. Now, I want you to ask yourself, is an argument of that form uh, valid? Do the premises guarantee the truth of the conclusion? And the answer is that arguments of this form are not valid, okay? The reason this argument form is not valid can be seen intuitively uh, that just because the antecedent P uh, leads to the truth of the consequent Q, and also just because Q is true, there could be many other ways that Q is true 
besides p being true. So again, just because p leads to q doesn't mean that q, uh, q must be true because of p. So to illustrate this with our example, where the first premise is that if it rains, the sidewalk's wet, and the second premise is where when we affirm the consequent, we say the sidewalk's wet, there could be just, so we can agree that whenever it rains, the sidewalk is wet. And we can agree that the sidewalk is currently wet, but nothing assumed here in these two premises rules out that there could be other ways besides it raining that have made the sidewalk wet. So for instance, it's possible that uh, the person who living in front of the sidewalk um, had their sprinkler set up. So in that case, it's not raining, um, but the sidewalk is wet. And it also is true that if it rains, the sidewalk is wet. So here, the uh, both premises are true, uh, but the conclusion is not. So arguments of this form, when we affirm the consequent, are not logically valid. Here's another example. Suppose I say, premise one, if Jane is angry, then her face is red. Premise two, her face is red, therefore she's angry. So here again, I'm affirming in the second premise the consequent of the conditional and inferring the antecedent of the conditional in the conclusion, but this is invalid. So for instance, it's possible that Jane's face is red uh, because she went for a run. So if, with that possibility, it's true that whenever she's angry, her face is red. And it also is true that her face is currently red, but there's some other reason than her anger uh, for why her face is red. So it's possible that these supremacies are true, uh, but the conclusion is not. And that's why, again, why affirming the consequent is not a valid argument form. Now, what about this argument? First premise, if Jane is smiling, then she's happy. Jane is not smiling. Can you conclude as a conclusion that Jane is not happy? Another question is that, does an argument of this form fit any of the argument forms we just saw? The answer is that this argument does not have the same form as any of uh, the three forms we've looked at so far. The argument we just looked at has this form here. So the first pr uh, premise is again this conditional if p then q. But the second premise, we reject the antecedent. We deny the antecedent of our conditional. And then in the conclusion, we infer uh, the denial of the consequent. So again, we say if p then q, not p, therefore not q. So an example of this would be to say, if it rains and the sidewalk is wet, it didn't rain, therefore the sidewalk isn't wet. Now is that is this a valid argument form? Is this argument here valid? And the answer is very similar to above. Just because that something just because when it rains the sidewalk is wet and it didn't rain right now, you can't thereby be guaranteed that the sidewalk isn't wet. And again, just as we saw with affirming the consequent above, the reason why we can't affirm the consequent is because there might be other ways of the consequent being true without the antecedent. Similarly, and for that exact same reason, if we, make the, if we accept a conditional, if we reject the antecedent, we can't infer that the consequent is false because again, there could be other ways in which the consequent is true, which do not involve the antecedent being true. So for instance, someone with um, 
the sprinkler on in their front lawn might make the sidewalk wet without it uh, raining. And similarly here, if we say, if Jane is smiling, then she's happy. Jane is not smiling. We cannot infer that she isn't happy because it's possible that uh, Jane can be happy without smiling. And just because we assume that whenever she is smiling, she is happy, that doesn't mean that whenever she's happy, she's always smiling. So this final argument form, where we say, if P then Q, not P, therefore not Q, we can call denying the antecedent. And denying the antecedent is not valid. It's, any argument of this form is not valid. So in a quick summary, we have just seen here four argument forms. The first was modus ponens, which we'll see a lot of moving forward. If P then Q, P therefore Q, this is modus ponens is a valid argument form. Now, the other one we just saw, uh, the second one is modus tollens. If P then Q, not Q, therefore not P. Modus tollens, just like modus ponens, is valid. But then we just looked at uh, two invalid argument forms. If P then Q, Q therefore P, and that's called affirming the consequent and is not valid. Any argument of this form, and for any sentences you slot in for P and Q, it will not be valid. And similarly, uh, denying the antecedent, uh, denying the antecedent is not valid. So here is uh, another example for practice. Premise one, if Napoleon got married, he conquered Alsace. Napoleon did not get married. Therefore, he did not conquer Alsace. Is this argument valid? Well, let's try to uh, understand its logical form. And when we do so, we see that it fits the form of, de of denying the antecedent, which is invalid. So in the first premise, we have a conditional and the an antecedent of the conditional is the sentence, Napoleon got married. Consequent is a sentence, he conquered Alsace. Now we can use these uh, capital letters as variables to stand for um, these sentences. So the first premise has a form, if M then C. Now the second premise, Napoleon did not get married, is a negation of the antecedents. So we'd write not M. And our conclusion is a negation of the consequent, which we set use C for. So the conclusion is not C. So we, what we can see is that this argument has a form uh, above of denying the antecedent. And this argument form is invalid. So when we start using some formalism of the, of the letters, and here we have the tilde for negation, um, we can use, we can begin formalizing uh, these sentences in natural language into a kind of more formal logic and it's more, uh, it becomes more clear to us whether or not the argument is valid or not, because we can look at its form. So another form of argument, which is valid, in addition to modus ponens and modus tollens is disjunctive, sil dis disjunctive syllogism. So here's an example of such an argument. First premise, Michigan's playing at home so let me repeat that. First premise, Michigan's playing at home or away. Premise two, they're not at home. Therefore, conclusion, they are away. So this argument has the following form, P or Q, not P, therefore Q. So P is a claim that Michigan's playing at home. Q is a claim that Michigan's playing away. So this 
the logical form of this first sentence is P or Q, or Michigan's playing at home, or Michigan's playing away. And the way we understand these two sentences is with P and Q. So again, the first premise is saying P or Q. And the second premise is denying one of the parts of the disjunction or. So the second premise is not P. And what we conclude is the other part of the disjunction Q. So Michigan's either playing at home or playing away. They're not playing at home, therefore they're playing away. And this is uh, a valid inference form. So far, we have been looking at what we can call the sentential logical forms of arguments. So what that means, and this is something which we'll get in a lot more detail into in the next few weeks, but what that means is that when we're trying to figure out the logical form of these arguments, we just use uh, variables to represent entire uh, simple sentences. So for, for instance, Mich Michigan's playing at home is assigned uh, the letter P, okay? Or the simple sentence, Napoleon got married is assigned the letter M. And then uh, in the simple sentence, he conquered Alsace is assigned the letter C. And then these uh, simple sentences are connected uh, with uh, sentential connectives like uh, conditional here, or there's a negation put in front of a simple sentence. Okay, so when we're trying to formalize or get a grip on the logical form of these sentences and these arguments, we're using these letters to represent entire uh, simple sentences and then how they're connected with, for instance, a conditional or a negation. And the formal logic we're going to be studying in unit two um, will be purely uh, analyzing um, logical forms that are similar to this, where you have letters for entire sentences. And there'll be no symbolization of what is happening inside of simple sentences. So that is a kind of limitation of the formal approach in this class, is that we'll be studying in a rigorous way how to tell whether a certain argument uh, is valid, but that'll only apply to cases in which we represent that argument using its sentential logical form. We don't, we're, we will not be looking inside of sentences, so to speak. Um, however, those many logically valid arguments in which in order to get a logical grip on them, you have to analyze the structure of the simple sentences. And we're gonna very quickly show you kind of what that means, but in order to get a, a thorough grip on that, that's something that you would do in a more complex logical cl logic class. And we're not gonna be doing that in this class, okay? But if you just look at sentences, uh, arguments like this, where you uh, have, for instance, Premise one, all dogs are mammals. Premise two, no mammals are birds. Uh, therefore, a conclusion, no dogs are birds. Okay, that can be understood as having the form like this, where we have a letter for a predicate. So we say all F are G, no G are H, therefore no F are H. And this, this argument here also has that same form. And we can develop a logic for analyzing this, uh, things like this, which are uh, complex uh, logical forms. But in this class, we're not gonna be developing a, a thorough logic to understand arguments uh, like this. We're gonna be focusing uh, for simplicity where we, sim where we, simple where we simply represent uh, sentences with P's and Q's and how full sentences are combined with connectives. We will not be looking at how to symbolize and do the logic where we kind of symbolize parts of sentences. Okay, so all of these inference forms here are uh, valid uh, inference forms. Um, and there is possible to develop a formal logic to capture that 
However, we will not be doing so in this class. So, and this is a point we'll, we will return to next week, but not every deductively valid argument has a valid form. And this, this is especially important in the context of our class when the valid forms we look at will be very simple, simple forms where we have uh, symbols for entire sentences and where we're not, for instance, uh, symbolizing how the internal structure of a sentence works. Okay, so the formal method we'll start developing next week for testing or determining uh, formal validity will only apply to some deductively valid arguments. And there's gonna be many deductively valid arguments, uh, which our method, our formal logic will not uh, be able to help us determine.